Hello everyone at the Children's Media Conference 2021. My name is Nigel Tramasi and I'm going to be talking to you about manga. Now, if you don't know what manga is or think you know but are still a bit unsure, you're in the right place because I'm going to explain the medium and why it should be of interest to you if you are working with young people. I'm also going to be talking about how manga can be a force for inclusion and creativity. So let's get started. So I am the co-founder of the UK manga brand Mayamada. Uh, I started this with a friend uh, out of university, actually a long time out of university, uh, but we've created our own universe of characters and stories. I have been writing manga titles for about eight years now and have a number of titles under our collective belt. My interest in manga has come about fairly recently since starting my business. But because a big part of what we do is work with young people from the ages of uh, seven, eight, all the way to teens, early 20s, it's given me a new appreciation for the medium and the connection that it has uh, with children. Because while it's often misunderstood, manga is a medium bursting with convention-breaking characters and diverse storylines able to engage young people in a way that other media cannot. So by the end of this session, I hope to leave you with a few key takeaways that include an understanding of what makes manga such a unique medium for storytelling, just why manga has the power to attract new and diverse audiences amongst children and young people, and how delegates at the Children's Media Conference can utilise manga to create more inclusive and forward-thinking content. So before we go any further, it's worth highlighting a key distinction. In this session, we're going to be talking largely about manga, but you will also hear the term anime. The two are different, but often related, because a fan of one can be a fan of the other. But where anime deals with images in motion, like cartoons, manga is a still form like comics. That's a simplification of both, but hopefully should give you an idea. So for a better idea of manga as a medium, let's ask one of our contributors, comic and manga artist Mikiko, to tell us what exactly is manga. So manga to most people uh, is uh, a style of comic art that is like usually big heads, big eyes, small mouth, small nose, comes from Japan. Um, but it's a lot more than that. It is actually a creative um, a style of of comic making um, and it doesn't really have to be from Japan it is a very specific style of telling stories uh, along with images and um, yeah in Japan itself it is also uh, caricatures it's it's comic books it's it's for girls for boys everything that is drawn and in story form is considered a manga um, it's just the west that kind of sees this specific mainstream style as as being the definite style <laughs> but like Japanese people would also say oh it's a manga if a if a non-Japanese person drew uh, a, a, a story uh, a comic or a manga I'm definitely grateful for that last part because as you can tell I'm not Japanese but I do have a lot of manga under my belt like I mentioned so while my manga journey started relatively recently it is something I have seen can take hold at an early age and grow with a child through their teen years and beyond. And to give us some further insight into this, I spoke to child and adolescent psychiatrist, Dr. Marcus Tan, who tells us about his relationship with manga and anime. I mean, I've, thought, I've been watching anime and reading manga from a very early age, but probably the first series that really made an impression on me was something called Card Captor Sakura. That was about when I was 12 years old. A um, lot of reasons why it made an impression on me. I think it was something that struck me as having many different themes at a very suspenseful storyline. I found it really interesting the fact that there was an antagonist, but no clear, you know, bad guy. So the, you know, the boundaries between good and evil in that sense were a bit fuzzier than the typical shows that I was used to. And there was also quite a strong romance theme around it, actually, between, um, between, between the, between several characters. So, between, both between the main character, Sakura, and her 
fund with love interest, Xiao Wan. But also the they also they explored the idea of uh the, the relationship between Sakura and her best friend Tomoyo. Um and it was very interesting thinking about that as well, and obviously thinking both what that meant in terms of for, for, for the person for Tomoyo and also what that meant in regards to the fact that it was same sex relationship as well. Um which yeah was actually which was something obviously that wasn't typically talked about in children's anime and manga at that time. But I think for me it was very interesting to think about and I think for me I found learning a lot about what love meant for Tomoyo, what this relationship meant in that sense. Men helping me learn a lot about love for myself as well. This idea of relationships and emotions is something we'll return to in just a moment. But what also fascinates me is manga as a medium for storytelling. It contains so many unique elements and is almost like a language within itself. Is that something you'd agree with, Makiko? Yeah, I, I believe so. So there is, there's very much of a back and forth, sometimes without words, that contributes to this rhythm that I mentioned earlier. Um, which which I find very interesting. You find a lot of panels in, in manga where somebody's face is shown and there's just dot, 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 dot. And they're just like the expression is really the reaction that is shown to something that just happened, for example. And and this can go for a while too. And I've, I don't think I've seen this in Western media quite as much. Um, there's also um, a way that they present scenes that is different. Um, where they often have a, a single panel setting a scene, but then pieces of the scene shown in multiple panels alongside of it, rather than going linear. Like after that, you'll show this. Bit. After that, you'll show that this bit. It's like simultaneous. It's a kitchen. You'll see the bubbling of the pot, or there's there's birds in the window, or there's there's little uh, pots of herbs on the windowsill, and all of this is kind of cut out and put forward so that the reader gets the smell and the sound and and all that a little bit more as a whole so these are kind of elements that are quite unique to to more of an eastern style and these are the things that i grew up with and that's why i want to obviously tell the story this way because it's easier for me it's kind of like my language of, of creatively sharing my stories so and it really is this style that first drew me to the medium it's allowed us to create a whole universe of characters that engage with young people and children through the maya Mada brand we create stories that are diverse but also have universal themes and it's always something that I've put forward as a unique selling point for the manga medium. There are so many different stories featuring so many different types of characters that everyone can find a home. And I really think it's this genuine diversity that makes such a big appeal for young people. It's not just superheroes or characters created to preach a certain message. There's a genuine range of backgrounds and views that are seen in the form of these stories. I think there's a very large diversity of of manga, and I think in all of but I think regardless of the medium that you're looking at, regardless of the age demographic that you're, you're looking at, I think all of them do make a conscious effort. I think to focus on the emotional content, to make it such that it's not just storytelling for kind of you know storytelling in the superficial sense, but storytelling on a more kind of like that that, that goes into quite a bit more depth about characters, about the story arc. And it really is this genuine diversity found in manga that has such a big appeal for children. They're not just presented with different superheroes or characters that have been created to preach a particular message. They're engaged emotionally and allowed to go on a journey with the characters that they see in these pages. What do kids these this age like, right? They want to feel cool. They want to they want to go on adventures. So we're going to cater to that, and then they boil it down to what can, how can a hero be, um, something that represents all of these people, right? So they they often have heroes that aren't too, like you know Japan is a lot more conformist than the West, so they have like a character that represents this teenage spirit or something. So it doesn't always have to be that they represent um, you specifically, you know. And um, it's the same for girls' manga. They're always 
a little bit more romantic and sometimes with magical girls. So they didn't have one magical girl because, you know, Sailor Moon is not the only magical girl out there. <laughs> the genre existed way before. So um, so there's like hundreds of magical girls to, to pick from. If you're not into magical girls, then there's romance. If you're not into romance, then there's rivalry. You know, so they, they just cover the whole area and, and they treat uh, their customers like, like seriously and I find that in in the West it's a bit different um, drawing stories about uh, like I've seen graphic novels that cover some like strange areas that are unusual maybe but the majority seems to be a cool superhero or gritty superhero I'm not really sure I don't read enough Western stuff to know now I also wouldn't claim to have read most of Western comics but I have seen enough to know that there is a hierarchy and superheroes are at the top, at least in terms of what gets shown, presented and celebrated. Now don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good superhero story as much as the next person, whether it's found in the pages of a comic or on the big screen. These figures can be so aspirational, but for young people uncertain of their place in the world, they can also be a little out of reach. As part of the My Matter brand offering, I deliver comic story workshops within schools, colleges and youth hubs. And no doubt whenever I'm delivering a session, I will meet a number of young people that are into the manga medium in particular, often bringing their own books to the sessions so they can tell me about their favourite characters. And it's this connection that stirs such a passion in young people and children that we want to explore a bit more. So Marcus, why don't you tell us why manga connects so well with children and young people? I think themes in general that it strikes, that resonates certainly with me and with the people I speak to about it is the fact that it's a very visual medium. It's there's a lot that it's there's a lot been spoken about about the idea that stories are being told to images and what that means for how the story is told. For example, one one fact one I think distinguishing feature of manga is the fact that they're very exaggerated expressions and very distinctly clearly explained storylines as well. Like, for example, the very caricatured way where people say, for example, um, might literally fall to the floor, you know, when they're surprised or literally sweat drop when they see something that they get a bit nervous about. So there's that verbalization of emotions like that makes it quite explicit and very and, and very kind of apparent to young people and probably in that sense more understandable. So the overall visual appeal is clear to see, but diving a little deeper beneath the surface, it's those exaggerated expressions that while can come across as stereotypical for the manga medium, can actually be key for making an emotional connection for young people. So Makiko, do you think this particular feature is something that actually connects well with children at that stage in life? And is this something that creators of manga are aware of when they're producing their stories? The manga creators are of some genres definitely are aiming to do exactly that. They, there is a huge um, focus on something we call seishun, which is uh, the time of high school, which is why so many stories play in high school. And so there, it's definitely considered like this important part where you, you, you're not quite an adult yet, but you have hope for the future, but you're not really sure. There's like uncertainty, but, you know, first love is happening and all sorts like it's like this perfect storm of things that people romanticize a lot in Japan. So if anyone ever wondered why so many manga stories take place at schools, you have your answer. It's that relatability, that inner turmoil shown, that emotional growth that makes sense to young people at that stage of their lives and allows them to process what's going on around in their world. Let's introduce student and young manga creator Sabrina Salami to tell us what aspect of manga particularly connects with her. Yeah, because in general, generally in Western classrooms, either the relationships seem too friendly or too unrealistic so that when you actually form bonds in real life, it doesn't feel like it's something that you've read. But for me, I resonate more with the relationships I see in mangas. And actually, this idea of realism is quite funny to me because manga can go to some very fantastical places. But underneath all that is the core of what really connects, a depiction of imperfect relationships 
and characters struggling through their emotions in a way that is more easily identifiable by children and young people. It's that visual verbalization of emotions where you may see a character in anguish fall to the ground or a massive sweat drop appear on their head to show when they're nervous. It's things like this that can connect with young people and allow them to understand similar motivations and emotions that they will be going through as well. But even despite that, I think it also doesn't dumb down the emotional content as well. Like, I, like Hard Captain Sakura is a good example in which it's a very multi-layered storyline with very complex facets and very sometimes very difficult themes that it basically doesn't shy away on. And I think introducing that to the young people in a way that to them is aesthetically pleasing is, I think, one very distinguishing, this one, one particular strength that anime and manga both have. Because I'm used to consuming media that makes everything look like it's behind just some sort of facade that it has to be perfect. And I prefer media that doesn't have that sort of restraint on it. So imperfections in stories allow us to examine and explore imperfections within ourselves and the world around us. And this is something that manga does so well. And when you pair that with the visual aesthetic that is so pleasing to young people, you get a great medium for allowing children to explore the world around them as they see and relate to it. And as Marcus said earlier, this is where manga can really excel with its ability to explore complex themes within its stories. Themes such as the nature of love and friendships, self-doubt and living up to high expectations, all the way to morality and the very essence of truth, as was so well explored in the anime and manga Full Metal Alchemist. So this is something that you might find on an everyday basis, but also in certain mental health situations. Marcus, is this something that you found in your work? Certainly, I think in the personal clinical setting, a lot of times young people have brought it in their, to their conversation. And in that context, it's something that I think that's worth thinking about and exploring, especially if it's a big part of someone's life. Actually. It often comes out when, for example, I ask people about what do they do in their spare time? And they say things like, oh, I watch stuff or I read stuff. And then when I ask what kind of stuff and they give a generic book films or Netflix or whatever it is, I often say kind of, give me some names. And that's when they start giving the titles and be like, aha, uh -huh. I, I know what you're talking about. As a more introverted character myself, I personally love that manga has such a focus on the internal. Whether it's characters who are doubting their own abilities or characters who might spend a little bit too much time within their own heads. I personally love that manga is a medium that puts these type of characters front and center, not just as support to the main characters, but as the lead protagonist themselves. So we see them struggle, fail, and question their decisions as they move through the story. I found manga to be more adept at showing this internal side, but what do you think, Mikiko? I find that in, 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 the, in the manga world, the, um, the, the inner turmoil of the heroes is much more important than them just being cool all the time. Um, it obviously depends on the genre, but personally, I, I very much like the, the window into the soul sort of thing, the, the, the growing of a character, which is, which happens in Western media too, but the, the camera is not on it as much, if that makes sense. So I, th I feel like you follow definitely like the emotional growth of the characters more than, than you do in the West. I think the other thing also unique in Japanese anime and manga as well is that there's often a focus on the adolescent, the younger person. This idea of the teenager and the school age children, very often the protagonists are that kind of age. So immediately that becomes more relatable to younger people as well. Stories are so often the way we process the world around us, and it's no different for children. I feel like with the more relevance that you consume in your media, the more you'll feel comfortable in what's going on around the world. Before we come to the end of this session, I want to take some time to explore the creative side of manga and how it influences young people to make their own stories and characters. As I mentioned before, it's something that I've seen in our workshops and conventions. So Sabrina, can you tell us how manga has influenced you 
as a fellow creator? I feel like it's influenced me a lot because generally I feel bursts of creativity whenever I read something because it's just I get my inspiration from the stories that I read and I get my inspiration from the artists that I see. So I try and incorporate that whenever I just feel like drawing. That's something I definitely identify with when you get those bursts of creativity. And for me with manga, the idea that you have so many different types of storylines that even as someone who came into the medium quite late can still find something that works for them, both on a personal enjoyment level, but also in terms of inspiration for future stories that I might want to tell. I feel like there's a lot of different genres within manga, so it can appeal to almost anyone. There's always going to be a genre that is going to appeal to someone that's used to Western comics. Like, there's... In Western society, we always have superheroes. They're always a thing. And in manga, they have shonen, which has superheroes. So that's a sort of link that people can make and that they can consume media that they're used to, but have it out of their comfort zone. Okay, so that's good news for those who might be new to the medium and looking for stories and characters that might be a little closer to what they're used to reading in Western comics. That's not to say more diverse, quirky and interesting characters can't be found in the West. I think from what I've seen as a creator and as a growing fan is where the focus is put in terms of the marketing as well as the types of stories that are told. I, I think Japan is a lot more child friendly, for example. So the the market is such that there's there's children's manga there's boys manga girls manga adult manga which is not the explicit stuff just for adults with adult themes like i don't know finances there's there's like wall street manga there's golfing manga there's cooking manga you know these are all things that children wouldn't necessarily be interested in i don't know about that i've met a lot of children that are interested in cooking or at least eating what has been cooked which is slightly different so point taken but anyway, there's also a link here to creativity, because once a connection is made with such a diverse medium, it can inspire children to create in many new ways. In a sense, seeing so many diverse characters and such emotional range can give children permission to create what's on their minds, as Sabrina explains. Uh, my favourite manga right now is Owari no Seraph, or Seraph at the End, because I just love the art. It's amazing. The artist... I can commend them for hours. Their work is just beautiful, honestly. If you have the chance to see it, just look at it, please. I love the panels. I love the characters, their bonds, their connections. It's just, I love it, I love it, I love it. The story as well is just amazing. So can you tell us more about the stories you're creating and the themes that you're exploring within them? In my own work, I like to base it in reality and have it very dysfunctional. So as we come to the end of this session, let's take a moment to consider the key takeaways. We've already heard how the format and visual style of manga makes it so easy to consume. And I think this is doubly the case for young people and children who may not necessarily be engaged in other forms of reading. The reason young people get into it though is because the, the style of storytelling helps them um, uh, like, it, it kind of like makes it very easy for them to get into. Just like I said, that when you start reading, sometimes you don't even notice you've read 10 pages because it flows so well. Um, and so if, if that happens and it's very natural and you can just tuck it in your pocket and, <laughs> and, and also, you know, cause, cause some, some people are like, Oh, I don't want to read a, a thick book. It's just so much work, right? A, a manga is easy. It's lots of pages with lots of pretty drawings and it, you, you're also on an adventure and you're watching a film. So I think it's like many, many factors that make it easy. And then there's also the part where there are obviously genres for everybody. Um, so it's, you, you just have to find the right one for yourself, <laughs> really. And there is much that Western children's media can and indeed has learned from manga, as Marcus explains, particularly the ability to engage its young readers in difficult topics. Using, using genuine emotion and often flawed characters to involve young people in the journey of these storylines and not just teach them what they should or shouldn't be doing. As someone who's grown up with manga and seeing how the relationship between Western media and manga they haven't developed in separation 
And I think over time, I think I've seen how Western media has become a more complex and more willing to engage with difficult topics. I think very often people view young children as people who need to be protected, that they need to be shied away from very difficult and very negative influences. And of course that is true. But I think also some, but I think also one must be careful not to take that to the other extreme and end up trying to protect them from absolutely everything that the world can do. And I think presenting difficult experiences, difficult topics to them in a way that they can, they can absorb and they can relate to, I think that it's, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy ask, but I think that's one of the things that manga and anime tries to do. And it's probably something I would encourage people who do Western media not to shy away from. We've talked a lot about this subject, and to be honest, we could have spoken a lot more about it. But I think we've got an idea of what makes manga such a unique medium. We have a very distinct visual style that uses often exaggerated characteristics that connect with a young audience. We have genuine diversity, not just in terms of the breadth of stories that are allowed to be told, but emotional diversity in seeing characters in different scenarios engage in different parts of emotional intelligence. And we have a medium that regularly depicts difficult scenarios and rarely tries to dumb down or preach to its audience. I hope this session has been a good introduction to manga or has made you rethink your perception of the medium. As a creator and a fan, it's something I'm constantly learning about and working with children has given me a great opportunity to do just that. So if you are a creator of children's media, please do take this session as an opportunity to consider manga for future productions or even just the lessons and see what you can learn from the medium and apply to your future productions. In any case, I hope this has been informative for you. Feel free to reach out to our team to see what we're working on or if you need any support in helping you see manga as a way you can reach your young audience. I have been Nigel from Mayamada. Thank you for watching and I hope this session has allowed you to see manga and its audience in a new light.